Hi, I'm Thomas the Accidental DM, and today we're going to be continuing to have a look at the new Dune Adventures in the Imperium RPG by Modifius. In particular, what I'm interested in seeing is what makes this different version of 2D20 than what we've seen before. Now, in full disclosure, this is a review PDF copy that I did receive from Modifius. Now, with that taken care of, let's just jump right into my thoughts on it. So one of the things I think that's kind of important as we kind of take a look then at this new RPG is that skimming around in the book, um, you can start to get kind of an idea of what makes some of this difference. But I think kind of the best way to really kind of see well, what is the core things that are going to make this version a little bit different is by taking a look first off then at the character sheet itself. So as we take our first good hard look then at the character sheet, there's a lot of things that are going to be very similar to what we're kind of used to with the character sheet for other 2D20 uh, games. But there's a couple of differences that I do think kind of stand out. Uh, one, we'd see kind of drives instead of attributes, which which is okay, uh, but there's this other piece that's kind of connected with it as well called drive statements, all right? And that's gonna play an important part then in this whole system as a whole. So we'll make sure we take, kind of take a look at what that is. There's also an addition down here at the bottom of this thing that's being called advancement points. Uh, so how does the advancement system work and why are there gonna kind of be points involved? It's almost kind of playing back to the old experience points that we see in a lot of other RPGs. So what are they doing with that? One of the other things I think that's big that's actually missing in this character sheet is where are the stress points. Uh, there's no stress. Uh, so how are we going to understand then when our character is going to be close to being defeated um, or when we're kind of finishing up uh, doing other projects in terms of trying to uh, get those extended tasks taken care of. So what does that mean then ultimately for the changes? So we want to take a look then because of what we've seen, the differences just here in the uh, character sheet. Uh, it's going to be some changes obviously done to the skill test. We want to take a look at that. Probably then going to be included extended task. Uh, there's this addition of character advancement point. So how is that going to work? Work with how we understand character advancement in the 2D20 system. And then obviously as well, it's going to have an impact then on combat. So those are kind of the main things I think that we really want to take a look at in terms of, okay, well, what's different about Dune Adventures in the Imperium as opposed to other games we've seen by Modifius? And one of the things I think that's kind of important when we look at it is kind of understanding really kind of the overall feel, uh, overall understanding of how the game system itself is trying to make itself work, uh, work out. And I think we see that very early on kind of in the introduction. Um, now, the, the known universe, as it's referred to in Dune, um, is... A vast expanse. I mean, it's absolutely gigantic. And it makes sense then for the RPG to want to kind of accommodate the, the scope and the feel that we're going to get then uh, from this particular world. Uh, so we've got this kind of universe wide uh, to kind of the imperial capital on Carino or even a small remote village on Walgus. So, I mean, it's got to be able to kind of adapt itself to that. And other games in 2D20 give us the opportunity to work at this kind of as a, both a micro and a macro level. But this is something I think that's kind of different than when we look specifically specifically at the Dune Adventures in the Imperium RPG, that for the first time it's really being laid out explicitly as a core principle, that this is how they're understanding the game to be played. And as we see here, uh, we, in Dune Adventures in the Imperium, we utilize two levels of play to allow players to work as powers uh, that be behind the scenes and as agents in direct missions. Archetype level play involves the player characters using their assets from a distance to achieve an objective. This might be as a general moving their troops or a spy master at activating agents as assassins or spies on a mission and then an agent level the player characters actually get their hands dirty and perform the missions themselves and so we see that then very early on there's going to be this two levels of play kind of the the larger kind of macro understanding that they're calling here uh, then the architect level and then the microscopic version the smaller level of that being the agent level of play and so how that's going to kind of work itself out that on the grounds versus then uh, the manipulating the universe. And I think, though, that that is, makes it very themed very well uh, for really capturing kind of the spirit and the essence uh, then of the Dune universe. And I see more of the, the campaign level work, uh, kind of the big picture, large story arcs. I mean, I think we can still have some shorter story arcs going uh, other ways, but I think the larger campaign narrative will be focusing, uh, tend to focus then on the architect level, whereas kind of the nitty gritty stuff is going to kind of be um, then kind of the individual missions at that agent level. Uh, but as with all things, it's, of course, it's going to depend on the GM, GMs and their players and how it is that they want to play Dune Imperium. Because you could put whatever rules, anything that you want in the system, uh, but it's then going to be then the various players who are actually going to make use of it 
or not make use of it. But I think one of the things that I do like right off the bat is we're getting this understanding of this is the world that we're that we're going to be playing in this this uh, the known universe and how that then kind of works itself out. And you have the options then of being able to do it on either the large scale or the smaller scale, which I think will be uh, something that'll appeal to a lot of gamers. Okay, now just backing things up a little bit, really getting right to uh, one of the things that I think uh, might have stood out for some people as soon as they started kind of taking a look then at the game uh, and kind of reading through the PDF. Um, there's a section that, and this is, this is really the first text we see anything about, uh, not just kind of the flavor text of what the world is like, but when we get in kind of the nuts and bolts and nitty gritty what this is about, we see right off the bat then uh, this section on if you already know the 2D20 system. So letting us know that there's some changes that are gonna be happening. Now. At the very core of the 2D20 is then the dice pool, and we're used to seeing D20s being used to determine successes, and D6s to determine the amount of stress or the amount of work that's accomplished on some of those extended tasks that we do. Um, but here, though, we see something that's different, this kind of first kind of departure of the system. Uh, it says, down here at the very bottom, Dune also use Dune all also only uses D20s, so this version of the system does not use the challenge dice, D6s. Okay, that's quite a departure from the system, because I think anyone who's been kind of playing any of the games by Modifius that use the 2D20 rule set are used to having a handful of D20s and a handful of D6s and using those, but now in Dune Adventures of the Imperium, it's solely going to be the use of the 2D20s. I'm not sure for the, 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 the reason that they might have decided to go this way, or if there's going to be some permanent feature then of the 2D20 system. I will just have to wait to see what Modifius does with future, future games that they do. But I think I can kind of see right off the that some of the things that this is going to be affecting in relation is obviously going to be working, uh, having to change then the way we do combat and the way that we do extended tasks. And I kind of see this then as an opportunity to um, kind of streamline those systems. So instead of, well, okay, I have to roll some D20s. Okay, I succeeded. All right, how well did I succeed? Okay, I got my momentum for that. Now let me grab a whole bunch of D6s and roll those and let's see how much work kind of gets uh, knocked off. I think that that's going to kind of cut down on one of those steps. So I can see very much kind of as streamlining the system. And in do, so doing, I think it provides in that opportunity for a lot more uh, cinematic opportunities to kind of really kind of narrate and kind of talk about and explain, well, what does this look like when you succeed? Not the mechanical parts of, let's okay, let's go back to a game component now, but how does that kind of play itself out as you're imagining the actions that you've just done and kind of relating that then to every, all the other players at the game? Now, it is then obviously pushing kind of a, a more that heavier narrative kind of focus. Now, the 2D20 system is already kind of heavily narrated focus, but we can see then then with the uh, exclusion then of the D6s, of the challenge dices, as kind of pushing that then just a little bit further. Now, is that good or bad? I don't know. That really, I think, depends upon individual preferences. Um, I Considering the other things that I've seen in the seen in the uh, Dune Adventures of the Imperium game, I don't think for me personally it's going to be that much of a distraction. I like kind of having this this uh, balance then of narrative and kind of game mechanics, the kind of the crunchy pieces of it too. But you know, I, at this point in time, I don't see this as being an issue. But then again, that's going to have to do with individual gamers and how they want to approach and how they enjoy and how they look then at their individual experience as the gaming table of TTRPGs. But this is obviously a direction then uh, for for this game that is going to be even more heavily narratively focused than we've seen it even with other uh, products from Modifius. So let's turn the now because we're obviously dealing then with some differences and changes from do, uh, having D20s and D6s. Uh, so let's see how that's going to kind of play itself out. And let's turn then now specifically to some of those game mechanics that are going to be affected. And I think the primary one that most of us are going to be dealing with right off the bat are going to be those uh, skill tests. Okay, and so when we're dealing with skills, uh, we start off pretty normal in kind of what we would expect to see with 2D20. I mean, we have some sort of attribute. In this case, it is being called a drive plus a skill with a set difficulty, and that's the way that we determine whether we succeed or fail on a task. So that's all pretty normal. Um, now, the uh, drives then are given the titles of duty, faith, justice, power, and truth, and we are given a little bit of explanation about what each of those are. And just, so I just want to kind of cover what those are just, just briefly. Uh, duty is the pressure 
pressure upon a character to find their place in society and fulfill their allotted roles, but also the weight of obligations and personal responsibilities. Faith is the moral expectation of religion um, and a character's spiritual needs. It shows their dedication to a higher power and the guiding hand of destiny. But a high faith drive does not always mean a religious or spiritual dedication, as some place their faith in their faction or friends as much as the will of God. And then we have down here, we have justice. Justice is a drive toward balance and fairness, but also the will to redress injustices. It often serves the law and the common good, but it can just as easily uphold bad law laws and be used as an excuse then for revenge. Um, then back up to the top, then we have then power. And power is the pursuit of greater influence, authority, or control over the universe around them. It is the character's ego representing their belief in their own moral authority and their right to take what they want. And then finally, the final drive is truth. Truth is a desire for knowledge and the need to uncover or define that which is true. It is dedicated to revealing the right answers, even if they are uncomfortable or even dangerous. Now, just from these descriptions, I think we can start to hear um, a little bit the direction that the, the idea, at least, of where this is supposed to be going. These aren't typically kind of what we think of, okay, with, well, this is our this is our, our mental acuity stat, this is our physical stat, this is our ability to reason stat. No, these are very much getting into kind of values and understanding the world and, and who these characters are as, as beings uh, within that world or within that larger universe. So this is, again, we can just see from the change then from attributes to drives and what those each drives sign uh, signify, kind of a differing, uh, differing approach then to how this game is going to be playing itself out. And then, of course, then we see then kind of, well, what does, what does the numbers then are going to be associated with these, uh, with these drives going to kind of entail? And down at the bottom, we did have then a table about the drive rating and kind of what does that mean? So a four, which is kind of the lowest you can have, you care very little about this thing. So it's there, it's part of the world, but it's not something that you're interested in, whether it be duty, whether it be faith, whether it be justice, whether it's uh, truth, uh, whatever, um, not something that's that important. And then we can kind of see that starting to build up. So we see then on six, this is certainly something that influences you. And so it has an impact on the way that you act and behave. And then number eight, this is the single most important thing for you. And so it's a possibility that one of these, whether it's duty, whether it's faith, whether it's justice, whether it's power, uh, that's going to be the primary focus that's going to kind of be driving you. And so definitely seeing then kind of a different flavor of how then this game mechanic of even skills is going to kind of be working itself out. And then in addition to that, you notice that when we hit that level six, it says this is certainly something that influences you. And if you notice right below that table, there is then the drive statements. Okay, and the drive statements then, I think uh, they're a lot like uh, kind of values if you're familiar then with that mechanic in the Star Trek Adventures uh, that gives you some bonuses when you're doing it, but those aren't kind of being separated then from the actual actions and tasks that are being taken. This is a part then of skill tests themselves. So if we take a, a quick look over then on page 142, uh, we see down here about these drive statements. If a character's drive agrees with their action, they receive a bonus. While if the drives conflict with their actions, they may be hindered. So, I mean, there's real kind of in-game mechanics. So it's, we can see right off the bat, this is different than the value statement, uh, which kind of helped us then gain some determination that can be used. But this is going to be something not that's kind of okay every once in a while, but this is a part then of almost every single role that we're going to be making, that this can ha then have an impact then specifically on the game. Uh, and following Following this, then there's a kind of a very long discussion then um, on uh, pages 146 and 147. Um, about then um, uh, about these um, on which drives to use uh, and how to use them. And I think one of the things that I find even more interesting as a turn of a change then in the way that the system is really working. Now, 2D20 has always been about kind of working back and forth between the player and the GM kind of determining how this is going to be happening. Uh, but very much that it's not now for the GM to decide which of the of the character's uh, values or uh, drives then is going to be a part of it, but it's something then that the PC makes. There's an interesting kind of statement uh, kind of made when we're talking about the procedure then for skills. The game master usually selects one skill to be used. Then the player should pick one drive they think is appropriate, guided by their drive statements. Okay, and so that kind of goes into the reason why there's this whole section then specifically on, okay, well, which, which drive should I choose? And then how can I kind of understand that kind of working out then in the system itself? Now, drive statements then aren't necessarily going to be part of every skill, because remember, it's only those that you have a rating of six or higher, those things that are important or have some 
some importance in your character's life are going to kind of be listed as having then one of these value statements or one of these drive statements. And that's not going to be something you're going to be using in every game, uh, in every role, because we do see kind of, well, when do we use these? So duty is about, does the action relate to your responsibilities or obligations? Faith, does the action rely upon trusting in others? Justice, the action relate to matters of morality? This isn't a full dis a full kind of statement about these, but just kind of giving us an understanding. Does the action rely on having authority? That's a power. Uh, does the action seek to uncover secrets? And that's kind of about truth. Um, and so you're going to kind of be making those judgment calls, and sometimes it's going to have only a four or a five uh, that's in that particular trait. And so then a value statement isn't going to be a part of, of that particular role. So, but it can then be, and it has then mechanics, uh, game-changing elements then, whenever, whenever then a player makes that choice. And I think then with this kind of decision then that uh, kind of Modifius is, is kind of making, is making this as part of a kind of a core component then of their of their system of doing adventures in the Imperium. Now, I, I know it's out of fashion to kind of talk about alignment because a lot of people are kind of uh, not, find. I think they find it too very kind of restrictive. Uh, and maybe then the, the, you know, the nine grids, lawful, evil, lawful, neutral, and all that sort of stuff, maybe that is a little bit too res uh, restrictive, but... Uh, I do think the kind of the, the 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 way that I look at it is I've always seen then alignment as being the the motivations and the values of the PCs, uh, how it is that they kind of act in the world, um, and if that's then like I said that's the way that I usually look at alignment, and I I see this then as being something then kind of very much fitting in directly with what uh, Modifius is doing here in Dune Adventures in the Imperium. Uh, and how it is it then, as a character, you are going to be acting in this world. The things that you see as valuable, things that you see as important, uh, and the things that you don't see as important. And how does that reflect then your behavior and actions? And that can change then uh, throughout the course, not just of a whole campaign, but this could even change in the course of just one session. Um, that you're kind of confronted with something. Well, how is it then that kind of challenges then a core held belief that you have? Well, how is it then you're going to kind of work that out in uh, in terms of your character and how that's going to play itself out. Maybe you've been betrayed by your house. What does that mean? And if everything has been about duty to the house and a member of your house now, uh, one of the things that you've uncovered is that there's um, there is a mole or there is a traitor. How is that going to kind of be looking then? And depending on who that is even, how is that going to change in the way that you work at, look at the world? And I just think those are kind of some core components. And, and okay, and, and it's not being called alignment here, um, but I think then, at least for me, it kind of works from some of those, of those same kind of points and parts. And so that's what I see here. The things that drive the PC, uh, they're not superficial, but they're calling the player to grapple with these issues during gameplay. Now that we've talked a little bit about what, what drives are and uh, just briefly about when you might use them, uh, well, what kind of happens? What, 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 how do they play themselves out in the game? Uh, and we see that here when we're selecting our driver, how that works. Um, it says, this reflects your character's motivations and, be and drive behind the actions. Okay, to select which drive you'd use, look at the character's drive statements and pick one most appropriate to the situation. Okay, we've done that. Now, once that's made then, how does that, uh, how does that work out? How does it agree with the action you're taking or Kind of disagree with the action. If the drive statement agrees with the action, then you can use that drive on this skill test. In addition, you're allowed to spend a point of determination on that skill test if you wish. You cannot spend determination if the drive you're using has no statement. Okay, so that's only for the things that you at least have uh, some value uh, in your in your understanding of the world. Now, if the drive statement then clashes. Uh, with the action, the drive does not support the action, or the action goes against the drive, then the game may, master may offer you a point of determination to ask you to make a choice about the drive. Either comply with the drive or challenge it. If you comply, you suffer an immediate complication of the action you are attempting, which could include being unable to carry out the action. If you challenge the drive, you can use it in the skill test, but the statement is crossed out immediately after the skill test is resolved, and you can't use that drive until you've recovered it. You know, you now doubt how you feel about the drive. You can no longer rely on it. If you don't want either of those options, you may refuse the point of determination and choose a different drive. And I think um, kind of to continue with kind of the game mechanic changes is this is not something solely for in between sessions, but this is actually something then that can happen and make some changes then uh, in the midst of play itself. And if we take then a look down here uh, in recovering drives, if one of your drive character statements are crossed off, then they are less certain of the drives. Okay, so you've challenged something. So you're not quite, uh, you want to believe maybe, uh, but you need something to kind of hold that in. And other place in the universe, next time reflection and counsel. 
the end of the scene during which your character contemplated personal matters or discussed them with another character. You did not spend or gain any determination during that scene. You may ask the game master to allow your character to recover a drive. Okay, that doesn't mean we just, well, we uncross out what it is that we've written, but there are some, there are actually game mechanics then to how is it then that your character is going to be uh, now understanding the world. So maybe you've had this discussion with a, with another player character uh, and how that they, uh, how they're, they're seeing the world now that, okay, there are some people that maybe will betray the house, but there are greater values of being a part of the house. Um, but how can that kind of work itself out? You have a couple of different options. One of them is as a new statement. Uh, so you can create a new statement for that drive, which, shouldn't, which should in some way reflect your character's change views and perspectives. All right. Um, or then there is changing priorities. Um, so that modify the score of that drive uh, by minus one. Uh, so if it was maybe uh, a seven or an eight, it's now going down to a seven or a six and choose the drive with the next lowest score to increase plus one. So if you're reducing a drive with a score of six, you would increase the one which had a score of five. If this would mean that the drive is reduced to less than six, then it no longer has a statement. And similarly, any drive increased uh, to, gain, to six gains a statement. If this doesn't reduce the drive score to five, then the statement may remain unchanged and no longer crossed out. This is something then that's not uh, at the end of a end of a session. This can something be happens then changes you in the moment in the time that you're at. All right, um, and for me, I. That, that's different. I haven't seen that before uh, being kind of played out. Uh, and we're seeing that here then in Dune Adventures in the Imperium. Yeah. All right. But I think then that really uh, we're, we're talking about an in-game mechanic um, that kind of deals with, with real world issues. How do I then view the world as a person, not just as a, as a player character, but when some of the things that I hold and I believe um, and I, I find to be true, when those get challenged or when those get debunked or when those get modified, all right, we've got to wrestle with those things. And so it's putting then that kind of uh, kind of grittiness of the real world, I think, directly into the game, which I think is, a, is kind of a refreshing kind of nice way of kind of taking a look at it. Of course, we're constantly being called then to reevaluate our lives and how we perceive the world and the same then with our player characters, that they have to look at okay, what is it that I truly believe in? What do I hold as important? And sometimes throughout time, throughout events, throughout circumstances, that gets less. And other times it grows. It just kind of depends on what's going on. Now, for my money, um, these drive statements are, I think, the biggest game changer in uh, Dune Adventures in the Imperium. But the second on the list, I think, is going to be the absence then of challenge dice. Um, so we want to take first take a look at extended tasks, and then we're going to take a look then at conflict. So I think those are the two that are going to be most associated then specifically with what we're used to seeing when it comes to challenge dice. And this, my friends, is the totality of what we see about extended tasks. It's a simple half page. There's no talk of linear tasks. There's no talk of gated tasks. Um, there's, it's just, here is what it is. Uh, each pass skill test counts as one or more points towards the completion. Uh, and when you, re when you meet then the required um, uh, number of, uh, of successes then, um, it's done. It's completed. All right. There's not really a work task. Now, based then upon the complications and the skill rating of the person that's creating or the thing then that's causing then the reason for the extended task that kind of sets where then that requirement for the number of successes are a bit are at and that I, I think does kind of sound a little bit like uh, a work track uh, but the work though is based solely on the skill test roles all right um, when you roll the d20 you're not rolling any d6s afterwards so there's no chance of coming up all threes and fours and you're like where's the work? Okay, I succeeded. Where's the work to that? We can't have that here because of the way the system works. So how much work is work is done then on these extended tasks is up to momentum spends, is up to PC traits, is up to quality of the assets going to be used. Assets, um, that's a new component, I think, uh, that we want to take a look at. It's not just terms of weapons, uh, but there's an element of it, of the quality of those assets, then they're going to be helpful then in trying to get things done. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now for combat, or as it's referred to in Dune, Adventures of the Imperium, conflict, uh, we want to turn then to page 162 in the core rulebook. And so we get kind of a, a basic kind of understanding of how this is kind of being all laid out. Uh, and I think one of the things to kind of uh, keep in mind is this point here. Conflict Conflict is not just physical combat. 
Uh, and any method to defeat an enemy with any tool can be conflict. Okay, oh, this sounds a little bit like extended task, and <laughs> hold on to that thought for a minute because we're going to see a little bit uh, that reflects directly back on that in a minute. Um, but basically, though, uh, the abilities and the skills um, and the uh, the assets then are what determines the victory. So of course you're going to be making that a skill test as with anything in the 2D20 system with rolling your dice pool. But then how the the quote unquote work, the quote unquote stress in this particular case is going to be dependent upon your abilities, your your PC's abilities, your PC's uh, skills, their levels of doing this sort of stuff, and the assets that assets that they have. Um, now the types of assets are also kind of change, or the, excuse me, the type then of conflicts are also changing up a little bit, uh, and I. Think I think uh, once again, it's kind of very much kind of reflecting then the the world of the uh, the the known universe, uh, and so there's five different types of conflict. We have uh, dueling. Uh, we have skirmishes, uh, we have warfare, we have espionage, and we have intrigue. Intrigue, And these both then have kind of different types uh, for the different kind of levels of play. Uh, so dueling obviously is going to be a lot more of the uh, kind of the hands-on, what, I, 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 what was earlier called kind of the, the agent level activity. Uh, skirmishes, okay, I think that can kind of go either way. You can either kind of be an agent, which is probably the, I think the most conventional, it's the one we kind of think of. It's, it's small groups of, uh, of people kind of fighting with one another, uh, maybe four or five individuals. That sounds a little bit like a player group uh, going after then kind of an enemy. So those kind of skirmishes. But then we get these larger things, uh, warfare. Okay, now with two, three, four, five different players gather around the table, um, it's a lot harder to kind of do warfare kind of on an individual basis. Now, of course, there are game systems that kind of have rules to how to kind of this works out. Uh, but this is the way that um, uh, 2D20, Dune Adventures, the Imperium is doing it, and it's kind of then focusing more on that strategic level, okay? Um, and so it is more that higher level, that architect level uh, that was talked about earlier. Uh, then we have espionage. I think that's one that can kind of go in, in both directions in terms of either at the larger architect level or at the more micro uh, agent level. Uh, intrigue, I think I could see it happening in both, um, but I think then it is more kind of an architect level because uh, it is about social conflicts where secrets and individu individual agendas are most prominent. Uh, so I think whenever we're dealing with uh, politics in Dune Adventures of the Imperium, at least from my perspective, uh, I think that's where that's going to kind of play itself out more is more on the architect level of things. Uh, now, two things that I kind of want to point out is that conflict uh, revolves around the use of assets. Okay, uh, and those assets then can either be physical or they can be kind of what, what's termed then in the core rule book as intangible. So uh, I think of the physical ones as being weapons, equipment, uh, technology, those sorts of things. But then intangible ones are those secrets, the, the info, uh, the espionage, the blackmail that you might have. And each of those things are going to be given. All asset, assets then have a quality that is attached to them. Uh, normally rated from zero to four, most assets have a quality of zero with only special or elite uh, kind of moving up. But these are things then uh, that the quality is about um, them being more effective and more impactful then on the situation that you're dealing with. Now, as it says, most assets have a quality of zero. It means they're not necessarily adding anything to it until you do something with them. You gain knowledge about how to use a rapier, okay? So that's going to increase then its quality to you. Now, someone else, you drop it, someone else picks it up, okay, it's still a zero, but it's got then something more because of the work that you kind of put into it, or you start develop you've, you've got then a, uh, you have a mentat that uh, you've kind of been brief, befriending over and over and over again. And at the beginning, okay, that's just a regular friendship. But over time, they're the ones that are processing ideas and are the great um, advisors then to the, to the noble houses of, uh, of the Imperium. And that relationship can get developed more and more. And as it happens then, the quality then of that relationship is going to increase. And so it's going to be more beneficial to you the further that you go down. So it'll have more effect, it'll have more impact. Okay, so we're definitely seeing then that uh, conflict is meaning uh, a variety of different things in the uh, the world of doing adventures in the Imperium. But in specific, uh, but specifically then, how is it then that conflict combat, that'd probably be the better way of talking about combat, how does that work without challenge dice? Uh, and the way that works is listed right here on number four in this conflict overview. On a successful attack, the outcome depends on your target. If your foe is a minor character, they're defeated. 
No rolling any d6s, no having a bad roll, and a minor character is still standing. They are defeated. So that's how the minor characters are taken care of. Otherwise, defeating the foe is an extended task with a requirement equal to the foe's most appropriate skill. Each successful attack scores points equal to two plus the quality of their asset. Once the task requirements have been reached, the foe is defeated. All right, so it's an extended task is what we're dealing with. Now, this is not the minor characters. This is then the uh, kind of the higher level uh, of people that we're dealing with. Um, and I think then that, that it doesn't matter then whether or not we're talking about a duel, you know, mano a mano, one person to one person that fight, or even talking about a planetary war or some political machinations that are going on. It's all then about the extended task. And without them rolling the D6s, again, I think this is a way of kind of streamlining the system, but also opening it up to kind of more of that cinematic idea, because it's an opportunity now. It's not just, okay, um, I got uh, three stress. How much more stress do you still have before you're out? Okay, I've got another five stress who I have to worry about. Okay, I don't have to worry about, then, oh, uh, do I need to spend momentum in order to avoid injury? No, we're not dealing with any of that. But we are opening up a better understanding of how it is that we can kind of visualize the scene, whether it is this kind of massive army uh, that's out on the back battlefield, all right, so we're not dealing with individual troops or anything like that, or even the individual battalions, but kind of this larger scale um, general versus general, and how that's going to kind of be playing itself out. And so you can talk about then um, how your uh, how your uh, copters come in and kind of take out a squad of infantry, uh, because you had your rolled your success, you rolled the successes that were necessary. And that's then one of those, uh, one of those requirements necessary of hitting your target goal for the overall defeat of this particular enemy that you're dealing with, or even in terms of moving individuals into place uh, during you're trying to assassinate maybe then the uh, the, the Padishah Emperor uh, and so you're getting people moved into their proper locations then uh, throughout the ball in order to have that one instance where everyone can act at the exact same moment all right and so moving them into place and I think then that gives that that real opportunity to kind of let us visualize it instead of necessarily needing to work out with all of the uh, all of the mechanics now again this is something that I think is going to depend upon the individual do I like this do I don't like that okay that's up to the individual all right um, but this is I think what dune is kind of presenting to us. Now, after all the changes, though, still need to say something about those advancement points, because that was kind of an addition we saw on the character sheet we haven't seen before. Now, in the 330 pages of this entire book, there is only really one page of text that's devoted to advancement, okay? Uh, and we can see that here. Uh, which is on page 139, and then there is a little bit as well we can see on page 192 uh, down here at the bottom on character advancement. Uh, but the important ones are really back up on page 139, um, and so that's where we're going to move back up to so we can kind of take a look at how we can understand then character advancement in the 2D20 system uh, for um, uh, Dune Adventures in the Imperium. How do we get those advancement points? Okay, uh, adversity, pain, failure, and peril. All right, so there's a couple of ways that we can do it. And I should say also ambition and impressing the group. And so we'll talk about those in each in turn. Adversity. You gain an advan advancement point from facing difficult situations, making mistakes, and suffering the consequences of actions. Failure is a harsh teacher. Okay, so it's possible then to gain advancement points for uh, having to deal with some of these things. Pain, gain one advancement point when you're defeated during conflict. Because when you're defeated, it doesn't mean death. Uh, I forget exactly where in the core rulebook it talks about that. I believe it's in the section on conflict in one of the, one of the paragraphs in there. Uh, uh, defeat in, in combat does not, or conflict does not mean death. Uh, but here then, during conflict, if you lose, you do gain one uh, advancement point. On failures, gain one advancement point when you fail a test with a difficulty of three or higher. Again, I think it goes back to the idea that failure is a teacher. Uh, peril, gain one advancement point whenever the game master spends four or more points of threat at once. Okay, hmm. maybe giving an opportunity for the game master to gain a little bit more threat if you want to get some more advancement points. Uh, ambition is another way that you can gain advancement points. You gain advancement points whenever you succeed in an action which supports your ambition. Um, I'm thinking, at least uh, there's nothing then in the text that I see that kind of confirms this, but I'm thinking this has to do then with how we work at our, our drives and our kind of, I think, our overall drive, the thing that really kind of moves us. If it's then an issue of, uh, well, we want to throw overthrow Shaddam the Fourth, okay, and we're moving then towards that. If we're then working towards that overall goal, okay, maybe we get some uh, advancement points uh, based upon that. Um, 
or three if the action was a major contribution to your ambition. Now, the one I don't necessarily like this name, impressing the group, um, but it does say if the group wants a reward, an especially good plan, re, re, role played scene, or other especially noteworthy contribution, okay, such rewards then should be restricted to one's procession for any player. I like the idea, I like the concept. I just don't like this idea of impressing the group because then it's a matter of, well, I mean, is it then something then that you're working as as part of who your character is, or is it just a way of kind of gaining advancement points uh, in terms of trying to um, metagame? So I, I like the idea. I just don't like the terminology that's used in there. Uh, so, and those then kind of how it is then that we go about spending then our, um, uh, our advancement points. So we can do it in a couple, couple of different ways. Um, and it focuses on our skills, our focuses, our talents, and our assets. And so the text then talks about the ways that that happens. We can increase one's skills by plus one. You can add an additional focus, uh, which is rated uh, with something that's rated six or higher. Uh, you purchase additional talents from those available to you. Um, you can kind of improve then your, your assets. And there's mechanisms on how that works. But the one thing that I really kind of want to kind of focus in and kind of talk about just for, just for a brief minute is the fact then um, that it is um, unique to individuals. So, um, it starts to kind of tailor it um, to the individual. So it's not just a blanket, okay, I've got X number of points so I can buy this many things, uh, this many advancements. It, it's really about then how the character themselves are kind of growing and developing. And I like this idea that these are unique individuals. And I think this is kind of one of the ways that that's playing into that, that they're not just simply the sum of some archetype, but these are individuals who are trying to kind of work through and understand and grow and, and get better uh, and how that happens. The other thing then that you can also spend... Um, advancement points on is also this idea of retraining, allowing one ability to atrophy or diminish with disuse while developing another. Um, and so then you can kind of lower your skill in one area by one to a minimum of four um, and then retrain that in a focus then um, or retrain that in another skill or retrain that into another talent. Uh, but there's a balance then to us all. So if you want to try to retrain a focus, you must remove a single focus you already possess because it's that idea of retraining. Well, I'm letting something kind of go away in order to kind of work a little bit more on something. I'm letting some talent I have kind of fall in the background. So you must remove a talent you already possess if you're wanting to retrain with a new talent in order for this other one to kind of come forward. I think, again, this is just a way of letting the PCs kind of begin become these, um, uh, these individuals as opposed to just us... Uh, words on a page. Uh, in the end, I do think uh, kind of Modifius is making some kind of bold choices in their modifications for doing adventures in the Imp Imperium. Now, thematically, uh, I think they very much fit with kind of the world that kind of that Frank Herbert kind of created in the Dune novels. Um, the functionality of them, I think it's going to really kind of depend on how well people use them, how well people kind of adapt to them, how well people kind of understand them and kind of want to want to play with them or not. But I do think they very much kind of fit within the world that they're creating. And I think that's one of the things that uh, Modifius is always, whenever they're tweaking the 2D20 system to fit it for a new game, that's, that's the purpose. That's the reason. Now... Personally, I've never found uh, the challenge dice to kind of bog down uh, the system. I felt it was already fairly streamlined. But as mentioned earlier, I, I do think it's a great way then of creating, allowing then even a more expansive cinematic vision of what's going on and what's happening at the table. But again, that has then the effect then of making this a more narrative driven uh, type of, of, of gameplay as opposed to a mechanics uh, type of gameplay. And that's kind of depending upon the individual. Now, uh, and... and I got to say, the Imperium, uh, the known universe, is an epic stage um, on which to kind of have games. And it definitely needs an epic vision in order to play that world out. And I see then Dune Adventures and the Imperium as having then the tools uh, to have the potential to be able to do that. Now, with that scope in mind, with that idea of this epicness of what this is trying to do and, and the world in which it's being set in. Uh, I did take a, a peek then at the included scenario. Now, I don't want to give any spoilers whatsoever um, to this uh, scenario for those who are going to want to be playing it. Um, so, but it's also, I've only had a read through. I, haven't, I have not played the scenario. I'm just kind of reading through it. I'm learning the system. I'm reading through the book, trying to understand how all this stuff is going together. So that's the only place where I'm at at this point. Um, I do believe from what I've seen, what I've read, is that it does capture the essence of the Dune universe. It gives us a feel for the world. It gives us a feel for the characters. It gives us a feel for uh, even, you know, kind of the mechanics, uh, you know, the characters, the, the behind the scenes relationship, the reflections on how current actions are going to affect or might change then the balance of power, which is Herbert's world that he created. So 
it also does, I think, a good job of letting me be able to understand how the mechanics uh, requested how they work. So I can kind of understand, I've, I've read the text of the, of the core rule book, and now I've read then the uh, the scenario included. I can see how they go together. I don't have any, any major glaring issues, like I have no idea what they're talking about here. There's none of that there. Um, I'm just not sure with, again, this particular scenario, I'm just not sure I saw the epicness that these changes that the system envisions with this particular scenario. I'm not saying it's not a good scenario. In fact, I think it's, it's kind of interesting. I'd love to, I'm, I'm waiting to be able to find a group to kind of play this one out with and see how that kind of works. It's, 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 a, it's an interesting idea. Uh, there's interesting things that are happening in it, uh, and it's visiting, you know, we're dealing with a world I'm, I'm wanting to know more about. Um, but just at first glance, I just, I didn't picture Muad'Dib riding into battle on a sandworm with an army of Fremen um, at the side in order to overthrow the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV. I just, that wasn't the image that I got in my mind with this particular scenario. And maybe that's just on my fault. But I'm thinking then, uh, and, and I'm not saying we need to relive then the scenario from, uh, the, uh, uh, from the movie. But what I'm saying, though, is I just didn't see in this particular scenario, at this particular time of, of what my expectations were for this for this game, uh, kind of playing themselves out in this particular scenario. Again, it's a scenario I'm wanting to run. I think it's going to be great. Uh, I just think then I want to be able to see that epicness that's being built out with the interplay then between um, this, this architect level and this agent level. And maybe that's just an issue then of we're dealing with a short scenario that's kind of meant as an introduction and not necessarily the sweeping epic campaign uh, that that kind of allows itself towards. So it's nothing then against the against the scenario itself. I think it's a it's it's a fun scenario to kind of play through, and I'm looking forward to it. But that's that's just kind of what I see as I'm going through. Very much dealing with a new game system, not completely overhauled. Um, but if you're used to 2D20, like I said, there are some things that are similar, but there are things that are different. And I'm liking personally, I'm liking the way this is going. So. Uh, if you have any questions about what I've talked about, you have any questions about what you've seen or maybe something that I might have misunderstood, uh, put those down in the comments down below. I'm happy to kind of take a look at those and kind of have this dialogue about uh, as we kind of explore and understand and, and look at new games and seeing how that they kind of play themselves out in the world. Uh, but if you did like what you saw, uh, please consider liking, uh, subscribing, uh, sharing this video. Um, and until next time, thanks for watching.